Hey YouTube, it's been a minute, but I'm back with some more developer content for you. So if you've been to my channel before, you know I usually do dev-related tutorials, but this video is going to be completely different. So over the last few months, I took a break from creating content, and I focused most of my efforts into a project I created called Guardian Forge. Guardian Forge is a third-party companion app for players of the game Destiny 2, which is one of my favorite video games of all time. I play way too much if you ask anybody who knows me. Anyway, this video is really going to focus on my discovery and planning process behind how I built Guardian Forge and how I took it from just an idea that was in my head all the way into something that's hosted and used by hundreds of users every single day. So before we get started, one thing I wanna let you know is there's going to be very little code in this video. This is all conceptual, we're gonna be talking high level, but at the end of it, you should have a really good understanding of how to put together a full stack application using AWS, which, which is what I used for Guardian Forge. Uh, additionally, if you're looking for help uh, with developer projects, come join my Discord, fullstack.chat, it's the link to get into that. Um, or you can reach out to me on Twitter, I'm at BrianMMDev. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got, so we'll jump right into it now. Okay, so before we even get into talking about the infrastructure and how I put this thing together, I at least want to give a brief demo of the app. Uh, this is Guardian Forge, accessible at guardianforge.net. The main gist of it is you can go up to this Find Players tab, type in any user of the Destiny 2 game, and then here's a list of all the characters they have in there. I'm a big fan of using the Titan character. So this is a list of all the equipment that my Titan uses at any given point in time, including any of the perks on all my weapons, the different mods, which affect the way that the different weapons and armor all kind of uh, synergize together. And uh, you can create a build. You can add some notes in here, some notes, and then click Save Build. When you do, the build will show up on this homepage under these latest builds here where you can select any one of these guys here and it's going to show you all of the details of, of that uh, user's character at that specific point in time. Where this becomes very beneficial is for different create for clans, for different creators out there, anyone who's looking to share specific loadouts because they really do affect the way the game plays. Inside of Destiny, there's all these different stats here that affect the way that your character plays and how different abilities regenerate. Uh, different weapons also behave differently depending on the perks that they have. Armor itself has different perks which can make your character, for instance, heal faster or regenerate their uh, melee attack faster. And then you can add additional mods on top of that to uh, further make your guardian stronger uh, in certain activities or, or parts of the game. So depending on how your loadout is inside of Destiny, it, it really does affect how hard or easy the game plays, and different loadouts can be used for different uh, activities within the game. So for example, what you're seeing on screen is a, a video of a content creator I follow called Castle. He's uh, demonstrating how you can use a, a very specific build for a Titan in order to optimize playing against other players in the PvP mode called Crucible. So I often review videos like this in order to find out what the uh, optimal equipment to use for specific activities, especially the higher end activities are, or certain activities which you go into with uh, different teammates, they, they can affect the way that the team plays together. Um, and one day I got the idea while I'm watching one of these videos, it's like it would just be nice to have um, a, a link inside of the description of a video, like outlining the entire uh, build that this video, this content creator is using, because um, if you ever watch some of these, which you could check the link in the description below, I left that link to Castle's video. They can get really complex, and when I'm watching these videos, I'm usually doing other things, so it's really hard for me to keep up with exactly what the, the creator's talking about. Um, and my memory is pretty terrible, so that's another reason what kind of sparks this idea in my head. So before I even start writing code, one of the things I have to do is I have to make sure that my idea is even possible to pull off. So there's a number of different Destiny um, third-party companion apps. So I know they have an API or something to work with or some way that these third-party apps are receiving data from the game itself. So that's the first place I started. I started searching for the Destiny API and uh, let's take a look at what I found. Okay, searching for the Destiny API kind of landed me on this page. You can see there's a number of different API calls on the left-hand side. These are all organized by, um, you know, kind of the, the general topic and which one of these uh, API endpoints are used for. Um, so this is kind of where I started. It's just poking around inside of here, seeing what we're looking for. I know one of the one of the things that I discovered first was the get character, uh, which seems to indicate that it's going to get uh, the character inf see returns information for the supplied character. So you can see there's a number of different parameters that are required in order to even get the character. We need the membership type, the destiny membership ID, and the character ID. And from that, a lot of it was just me uh, sifting through these API docs to try and piece together exactly what a lot of the stuff meant. So to be entirely honest, a lot of uh, this process is really just kind of poking around the API and testing out some endpoints to find out what works and what doesn't. Uh, we could see that there is a set of user calls here. So if I see get Bungie user net user by ID, 
you can see we'll get uh, this responsive general user and we have the membership ID, the display name, profile picture, uh, and a bunch of other information here that more or less kind of corresponds to what exactly we're looking for to get out of the character. You can see here one of the things that is required is this this XAPI key header, which is a, a unique identifier that identifies your application inside of Destiny's ecosystem. So uh, it says here when you're registered, you have to go to uh, when you register an application at this specific URL, you receive an API key. So that's really kind of the first uh, spot where we uh, had to start here. So inside of Bungie's portal here, you can see I have this option to create a new app. Uh, once you create the application, I'm not going to create one now, but you name it, you provide a website, and then it provides one of these API keys, which is really just a, a randomly generated uh, string of characters. And then we can use that API key in order to make calls into Destiny's API. Okay, so in my project here itself, I'm using an extension called the uh, VS Code REST uh, API client, which I also have a, another video on my channel. I'll go ahead and throw a link to that up in the uh, upper right hand corner if you are a developer and are interested in that. Um, but this is really kind of where I start exploring different APIs. So um, you can see here's a here's an example of a, a request to get a user by the, the Bungie Net user ID. Uh, so if I send this request and provide it with a bunch of information here, and um, this is kind of, again, my starting point to try and like sift through everything and figure out how it all connects together, wires up, and then just works in general. Um, this tool is very useful for, for trying to, to discover all this information because you can quickly, using text, just pass information in here, search through, and, and then execute the, the API uh, right within VS Code, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so after I gathered all the information I need, uh, you'll see here's an example of that get characters call. We got the profile, there's my profile ID, character, and one of my character IDs. If I hit send request, you can say there's an invalid parameters because we're missing the components query string. And this is one of the things that confused me pretty early on. Back inside of the documentation, you can see there is a, a query string parameter uh, named components, um, but there's no further information here beyond uh, C Destiny component type to figure out uh, what's being pulled down. So if I copy that and search for that, you can see on the left-hand side under enums, there's this list of different component types you can, you can return back. So I went ahead and put a list of components inside of my call here, and I went ahead and executed it. And all of a sudden, you can see we have all this information available to us. So I could totally see that there was an item hash and instance ID, but a lot of this I, I'm, I wasn't really sure what to do with. So I started doing a little more digging around inside of this portal, and I came across the call called Get Destiny Entity Definition. And you can see inside of here, we can pass an entity type and a hash identifier. So we never getting close, but I didn't see anything about an instance ID in here. So if you call one of the things I said is that there were some third party apps. So I decided to go ahead and start uh, inspecting some of these third party apps to try and figure out how they were doing other information. So refreshing this page, you can see there's a number of different uh, calls that are made into into the Destiny API. And so it's specifically here, here's one that has components and all the information we just recently saw inside of VS Code. However, I also noticed there was this call called the manifest and I've heard about the manifest before, but I wasn't entirely certain what exactly it was or meant. Uh, if we go inside here, uh, take like just for example, JSON World Content Pass, which is a lot of what I use, you can see there is a URL here for English here, right? So I went ahead and copied this. And since this is just a forward slash common, we know that where this is going to be is HTTPS uh, www.bungie.net slash whatever that URL is. So let's go ahead and open up a new tab and take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so what you're seeing on screen is the result of one of these component, one of these manifests being brought in. So this doesn't look the greatest because uh, my browser is having a really hard time trying to render this just because there's so much information in here. But just as a quick glance, we can see this. There's this gambler's dodge, which I know is an ability inside of Destiny. Uh, there's also hashes here, which seem to correspond with this this hash information that we've seen inside of our calls. So I knew that the man, the manifest was something I had to learn how to work with. This is a part of the video that I'm not going to show. What I actually discovered with full-blown manifest for Destiny is about 138 megabytes, which is huge and makes total sense as to why my browser couldn't render it. It was just too much data to efficiently be rendered inside of a browser. So I started doing some digging for tools to, to try and start playing around with some of this JSON data. And uh, I settled upon a tool called Dadwrite, which I'm going to demo for you right now. All right, so what you're seeing right now on screen is that tool I was just talking about called Deadroid JSON Viewer. Recently become a huge fan of it. I have never heard of it before this project because I never really had to work with the JSON data set quite as large until I built this project. Um, so just picking out one of those hashes that we saw in the, the previous API call, if I paste one of those in, you can see that it actually searches pretty quickly through the different nodes here to try and find some information. So we can see like there's a source here. If we click display, display properties, uh, you can see Liar's Handshake, which I know is a piece of armor inside of Destiny. You can see we have the icon here. 
And one of the other things that was nice is even though we found uh, this specific hash inside, on the bottom here, you can see the full path inside of which uh, node component it was, where the hash was, and then the different, uh, the different uh, pieces of information you have highlighted, it changes to kind of help you identify that path, which is really helpful for building the application. So at this point of the process, I pretty much was confident that I could build this application. And really the next part of it was just planning out how I wanted to structure things. Um, I, I knew I wanted to use AWS and I wanted to try and pick one new service I hadn't used so far because usually when I create new projects and uh, do these kinds of things, I like to pick something to push my boundaries. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the infrastructure that I designed and how things work. Um, keep in mind that this is not how things work today, but this was just the original planning process behind Guardian Forge. So whenever I approach a new application, I generally like to try and split it up into three separate categories. You have the front end, which is the client that the user is actually going to interact with. You have the back end, which is what the, the front end is going to interact with. That's where your API is stored. And uh, some people lump this last thing into the back end, but I like to think of it a little differently because uh, realistically it is a different layer. And that's the storage layer. So where will the data be stored? I also like to break out things that I want the user to do. So for instance, I want them to be able to search for Destiny users and, any, and select any of their characters, create a build and add notes and other meta information as I demonstrated earlier in this video, and then be able to view and share builds, which is ultimately the core of what Guardian Forge is designed to do. So uh, let's take a look at some of the pieces of infrastructure I chose and why I made this decision. So of the three big front end frameworks, Vue is always my preferred choice just because it seems to resonate with me the most. I don't have anything against the others, but it's just my personal preference. I've hosted Vue apps inside of AWS before. In fact, I've actually created video tutorials on how to do that. I'll go ahead and throw a link in the upper corner of the video as well so go ahead and take a look there for the view application for that front end piece uh we're gonna we're gonna use two aws services the first is s3 which is used for storing unstructured data uh it's kind of like a file system but but a little more advanced than what would you would expect to find on your computer um, this is where ultimately our built view application is going to end up and we will access the raw files for that view app um, and then i'm going to put an instance of cloudfront in front of it and what that cloudfront does is, is it is a content distribution network it essentially replicates your uh, front end files all over the world. Uh, so this way, wherever your users are accessing your application, it's going to optimize the speed because it's the, the files are geographically closer to them uh, than they would be if they were stored in a single data center in one spot of the world. CloudFront also has the capabilities to uh, create some pretty advanced routing rules. So you can um, you can redirect traffic depending on the URL. And uh, while I didn't do anything with that at this particular point in the project, um, I did eventually use the routing rules for open graph information, which I'll I'll describe in a later video. Okay, so for the back end, there were three main services I chose. Um, I, I really kind of started off with just using one, which was an application called LightSail. And this is what I had never used before. I've used all the other services I describe in here I've used before, but LightSail was pretty new to me. Uh, realistically, what LightSail is, is just a, it's a way for you to easily spin up Linux VMs or Windows VMs, uh, virtual machines, inside of AWS. You kind of get your own dedicated server. It's very similar to like a, uh, like a, a, a droplet by DigitalOcean. So I used LightSail to create a Linux uh, VM that I wanted to host my app, my API that I just, that I wrote in Go because Go was one of those other things I wanted I'm, I wasn't super familiar with I wanted to create an actual functioning API in Go. So the next service I decided to use for the back end or the API is actually API Gateway. Um, I could have called LightSail directly, but I decided to, to put an API Gateway instance in front of it because if I ever wanted to change my infrastructure, which, spoiler alert, I did end up doing at some point in this process, um, I could simply add some different redirection rules for the API and fo start forwarding that traffic to a different uh, different destination. API Gateway acts almost as like an entry point for APIs into the various AWS services. Now for storage, there's actually two services here. The first one is DynamoDB. It's a NoSQL solution AWS. I use Guardian Forge as an opportunity to practice modeling a uh, single table schema design for DynamoDB. And the main idea really is to use DynamoDB as more of an index instead of a full database. Um, it seems to operate the best that way if you're not storing huge amounts of data inside a Dynamo, but small snippets that are required for various points of your application. And then the last thing I used for the storage was, again, S3. So instead of storing the actual application files from the front end, we're using S3 here to store the core build definitions. So just as a quick demo inside of Guardian Forge, the difference of this, if I look at these different entries inside of the latest builds, these all come from Dynamo, which are just these little snippets. So it doesn't contain all the information. However, and clicking on one of these, when the, app, when the page loads, 
all the data you see inside of here is actually pulling back a raw JSON file directly from S3, bypassing uh, my having to store all this information inside of Dynamo. And really what that translates to is uh, cost savings because it is cheaper to store data inside of S3 than it is inside of Dynamo, provided it's not accessed too frequently. If we take the various components of AWS that we're using for this application and then we restructure them uh, to take a look at exactly how everything talks and communicates to each other, this is, is pretty much what it looks like. Uh, so on the top top lane, you've got the front end that's being called. Uh, the client will actually talk to CloudFront first. If the website file that it's looking for is not inside of the cache, what it'll do is it'll it'll request that file from S3. Uh, so once that file has been loaded up in a CloudFront, it never has to really request it again because it'll be distributed to that that endpoint. Whenever the application requests any kind of data from the system, it'll it'll first go through API Gateway, which then forwards that traffic into LightSail, or rather my virtual machine that's hosted inside of LightSail. And then depending on what kind of data it's requesting or what kind of operations being done, it will it'll contact and communicate with DynamoDB to, to either uh, pull records from it or store records from store records to it. And then the last piece of this is those build pages themselves. If, if when the build page gets loaded, instead of accessing API Gateway, it'll actually go directly to S3 to pull that information in. So the last thing I really want to talk about for this video is actually how I store my code and how I kind of manage my work process and then my deployments. Um, the obvious platform to use is GitHub. However, I'm a real big fan of Azure DevOps. And um, aside from the name, it actually has very little to do with Azure. It used to be called Team Foundation Online or Visual Studio. Visual Studio Online, I can't specifically remember. Um, but at some point along the lines, Microsoft decided they needed to throw the name Azure in it just to make it sound cooler, I guess. I don't know. Uh, anyway, so let's take a look at how I'm using that. Okay, so we're inside of Azure DevOps, and you can see on the left-hand side, I have a number of modules that I have here. Uh, boards is one of my favorite places to work. If I go inside, you can see I can I can store all of my different tasks and things that I want to do, and then I can also create sprints out of those tasks if you're familiar with Agile. You can then create tasks on top of the product backlog items and then manage them kind of through the whole workflow process. Additionally, the code files, itself, the code files themselves can be stored within uh, Azure DevOps as well. If I go into commits, and this is one of the really neat things, you could see we have uh, tags that relate to the different releases. Uh, if you go inside of pull requests, which I have not used in quite some time, depending on the the commit message you put, because it actually links the uh, the pull requests and the commits, all that stuff up directly with the uh, with the product backlog items. So you can kind of have some visibility and traceability on what work, what pull requests, what commit, how they all link together, which is really handy. And then the last bit that I really use in here inside is the pipelines, which this lets me to find custom release processes that um, I can use to control the releases of uh, the, the new builds of Guardian Ford. So instead of having to manually build this every single time, you can see I can come in here and I have different environments that are set up and inside of those environments, I have a bunch of tasks that are set up in order to, to build and publish the different components of the overall uh, application. So that was kind of my discovery and planning process for building Guardian Forge. Mind you, this was done quite a while ago. Uh, so a lot of things have changed uh, in the application since this was first done. But um, we're going to go ahead and cover a lot, of the, a lot of those things in some future video releases. Um, I hope this was helpful. I hope someone got something out of it. If you like uh, videos like this, go ahead and leave me a comment below telling me you want to see more content like this. Uh, or just tell me six tutorials. That's fine, too. <laughs> um, if you're interested in getting in touch with me, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at BrianMMDev or on my Discord, fullstack.chat. And... Uh, yeah, I'll see you later.